You're listening to The Riff, a podcast by North Point Church. There's a lot more to the Christian journey than what can be presented in a 30-minute time slot from a stage on Sunday morning. Our host and lead pastor, Jeremy Johnson, highlights the vision of North Point Church and the Christian journey through stories, interviews, and unfiltered faith ramblings. We hope the conversations will help you engage in how faith interacts with your life. I think we're ready. Let's go for it. Welcome to another episode of The Riff. Today, Justin and I sit down and we talk about the, the subject of grief and, and, and more importantly than even a topic, um, it's, it's very personal to all of us. And so I know whether you're in a season of grief, you're uh, connected to someone who is, or you're recently out of one or soon to be back in one. Uh, I hope some of the things we talk about will become handles that help you be comforted and help you be a comfort to others as they go through this. So uh, thanks for joining us. Welcome to another episode of The Riff. And Justin, we got you back today. Now, here's the deal. Mm. I just got to be honest. Yeah. Uh, there are some times when we have an episode of The Riff comes out, and sometimes people's attention span is only as long as it takes for them to see if you're on the show. Wow. Um, you are, and I don't know if it's widespread, so I don't want to make, make it, it arrogant, I would but think it would be. You are, you've got a following out there. Well, and, I mean, uh, I believe we did talk about a Belgium following, and we, I don't think I did. don't think you sell in Belgium. I don't. So there's something yeah. about me yeah. that I think no, is really but I, attractive to you. I, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get no, there. So I've been I've been meeting with some consultants, <laughs> um, and uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get our Bel- Belgium uh, folk. So uh, today, uh, where, where are we going? Where oh I, man. Okay. So listen, we we failed at take five a couple weeks back. I don't think we failed. We exceeded. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I'm an optimist. So if you haven't listened to that, take five, an idea we had, uh, to where we take five minutes and answer questions that come in. And we spent 30 minutes on it, on one question. 29. 29, yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't really take five, um, but we're going to do it today. Okay. So we're going to take... Take time. Take take time. time. (laughs) Take time. New segment called Take Time. (laughs) Take two. Let's take time. So we've got some questions that have come in, and there was one question that came in that- Which side uh, note. Yeah. This mystery of questions come in. Yes. How do oh. questions come in? Yeah. Because our viewers want to know. Uh, you can go to the website uh, and click on the riff, and right in there, you're going to see a space to ask questions. And then also uh, on this episode, if you go to the show notes, there'll be a link. You can click it. Ask your question. They Boom. are anonymous. So show notes. Uh, yeah. So, show so notes. I thought you were going to go show choir again. No, golly. Because you were in one. Yeah. We, we talked about that in a previous episode. Yeah, we did. And yeah. Uh, huh. yeah. And shocking. I haven't talked about it since then. Really? Yeah. Well, it hasn't come up in. I am going to do my part to make sure no, you get a chance to it. talk I, about your show choir that's days. Cool. That's cool. So uh, these are anonymous and they come in. So I've got a couple questions. One of them that I'm going to ask you and. Uh, kind of poke around on the question because I think it's important. Uh, one of the things that we've seen uh, through this podcast um, is that everything that we've talked about um, on mental health in yeah. the church, um, that's been the most listened to uh, and most requested and talked about episodes that have been done uh, by a lot, actually. Um, so we had Dr. Swift come in. Uh, we talked about one. Jake Smith talked about one. Yeah. Um, those have been very, very listened to. Um, and there's been a lot of response. So we kind of wanted to dive into that. And, and also this question kind of touches on that. Even okay. though it's not directly mental health, I think that we're going to find that it is. Because I think Christianity as a whole, um, in my opinion, does a poor job on it. Yeah. You ready? Let's do this. Oh my goodness. I'm intrigued. Right. You set the bar low. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's the question. This is possibly a two-part question and perhaps a little long. So take five, probably not going to happen, but here we go. All right. My boss, friend, and longtime mentor's 17-year-old daughter was recently hit head-on and killed by a drunk driver who was also killed. She was a great girl, 4.1 GPA, worked extra hours at Subway in order to give more towards organizations that she was passionate about. And I know my boss and his wife are believers and do believe in God's plan, but I don't know how strong their faith was or now is. So here are my questions. How can I show up and reflect Jesus to him when the time is right? How as a father of two daughters, do I not live in fear of losing them? I'm going to cry. What in the world? I've got two daughters. Father of two daughters. (laughs) Uh, Do I not live in fear of losing them and picture what they went through? It's selfish, I know. But can you touch on deep mourning? 
Yeah. So this is what I don't think Christina did as a good job with. Um, and, and why I have that opinion, and it's an opinion, um, I think it's easy for Christians and for the church to focus on, um, when we talk about death and resurrection, we, we talk about the hope and we talk about the resurrection. Um, I don't think we do a great job as a culture talking about the three days <laughs> where the disciples like ran away. Right. <laughs> they locked themselves in a room. Mm-hmm. But we get to Sunday super fast. Yeah. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with the mental health thing that we've walked through. Um, there's a grieving process. So um, I just want to ask you that question of what do you see as a pastor? You've walked through a lot of these scenarios and situations over the years that you've been a pastor. Um, so I just kind of want to get your perspective on grieving, um, on how to grieve and what's healthy and what's not healthy. Right. Uh, I mean, I mean, as as this comes in uh, the day that we're recording this episode, I mean, this weekend we're preparing for um, a similar type of funeral of mm-hmm. a family getting ready to have a funeral for their child, and um, you know, so so grief is a very big part of life. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, when Jesus died, uh, dies on a Friday, rises on a Sunday. We celebrate Easter Sunday. Black Friday in our culture is a shopping spree. Uh, historically, it's a day where even those closest to Jesus who had the biggest heads up, um, little keys and cues that Jesus would say to his disciples like, I'm going to die and rise again on the third day. We're going to Jerusalem right now where I will die. He was very as clear as he could be, um, but his his entourage at the time when he did die on the cross, um, they had no hope, no hope. Um, And he had been very clear, this is what's gonna happen and we'll rise. Um, So they erred in those moments of forgetting that there's hope. And often um, Christians since that day err forgetting that there is grief. Mm. And, and so there, you know, where the disciples didn't have hope, um, sometimes 21st century Christians, we could not have grief and that's not healthy either. So, um, yeah, so we can poke and bleed into this topic. I mean, I, the, the, the question that hits me, very similar to you, I'm a dad of two daughters. And when you realize the, um, the stakes uh, that are at play as humans, that there's only, um, all of us will uh, face death. We don't know when. Um, some people will face um, tragedy in life that doesn't result in death, but it still is cause for grief. What do you do with that? And, um, and our ultimate promise is not that we'll live to be forever. Our ultimate promise is not that uh, those who love God and who God loves will be immune um, to, uh, to death, sickness, tragedy. Um, at the same time, we feel very ill-equipped when it happens. Um, and so what, what do you do to reflect Jesus? I know the question was, well, how do I reflect Jesus? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's to love, to care, um, to, to encourage, to grieve. Uh, on that, I, I think that looks a lot different for a lot of people. Uh, yeah. My wife and I, were, we went to a, an author. Um, he, he had a night here in Springfield and, and he talks a lot about grief. And... Um, kind of poking fun at religion on it because there are these certain statements that we make um, as Christians that are probably meant to be helpful, um, but probably come across hurtful at the moment because it doesn't meet the person where they are. So like if, if I'm in a situation like this gentleman here, how can I show up and reflect Jesus? I think a really important thing is he says when the time is right, how do you feel those moments? Like as a pastor, right? Mm -hmm. Like most people are not, in these situations week in and week out to where it's like, man, I don't know what to say right now. And the words that I do say, I know are going to be heavy. Um, and I don't want them to be taken as hurtful. Right. So what would you say to that? What, what, what are you looking for in those moments? Yeah. Um, how do you meet them where they are? You still say there's hope, but not like a dismissive, Hey, they're in a better place. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, I got to understand what tension 
is coming from me that I'm trying to dismiss with a platitude and to realize I might feel better because I alleviated this tension of, oh my goodness, there's the parent of the person who's experiencing grief right yeah. now or, or they just had a great loss in their family. Um, I feel awkward because I just ran into you and so now I'm processing your grief in a way that feels like grief to me. And so how do I dismiss it? I'm going to give you an encouraging platitude about, I don't know why heaven stole another angel. Um, I don't know why um, their time had come. Um, and, and something that allows me to deal with my tension that might cause more angst and tension on the person dealing with grief. So what I try and do as a pastor, obviously being positioned in a spot um, weekly where you're, talking to people with grief is just to be present, to not try and rush to a happy ending, to just say, man, I care. I want you to know that that we care deeply with you, um, that we hurt with you. I mean, this is terrible. And um, uh, what are some practical things we can do right now with you? And then look, uh, can I observe? Because they might say there's nothing, but there still might be something. So so as a pastor or as a Christian or as a person in the middle of grief, you don't need to fast forward this. Just be there, listen. Um, it's not a time to necessarily um, theologize. It's a time to be present. Um, and I think even if we go to scripture, and we see Job, a story of grief. Um, the, the biggest challenge from his friends is they tried to justify why. And when you justify why, you either put God on trial or the person grieving on trial. And neither of them are helpful in the middle of grief. What you want to do is just sit there and absorb and um, just shoulder a little of the weight um, because it's, it's weighty, it's heavy. And it's overwhelming. It's too much weight for one person. And so if I can at least say, hey, can I shoulder some of this with you for a season? Um, let me do that. So I would say that's what you do in the moment. Yeah, it's good. I think the second part of this is important as well. I know that I uh, and my wife have, have walked through this and we struggle with it. Um, how do I not live in fear of losing them? So yeah. I know that there have been times when like we'll be sitting on the couch with the girls and there's almost a sense to where you can't even enjoy it because you don't want to lose it. Yeah. Like, that's crazy to me to think, but that's, yeah. Like, that's life. So, we talked about, I thought you hit really well in the last Take Five episode about salvation and about here and now, and like the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? right. So, there is a there and then, but there's also a here and now. How, how do, do we as humans um, not live in this fear of the grief, right? but you live present in the moment, what are, what are some pieces that you've done? I know that Jamie and I look up to you and Leanne a, a lot because um, I feel like you guys live with joy and we love your kids. <laughs> like, we do too. They're good humans. Yeah. So, so what, what's something that you've done through, through your and Leanne's life to, to live in moments and not be um, <laughs> chained down to this idea of like, oh my goodness, I don't want right. to lose this. How have you done that? Well, I think I think some of that fear or anxiety comes from trying to control something that I'm not designed to control. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> and as a parent, we convince ourselves we read books and we watch uh, YouTube videos and we go to seminars and we almost convince ourselves that we're in control of this kid because we get into this study knowing we have no idea how to parent. No one is prepared to parent. And if you think you are, you're woefully unprepared. But then we, out, out of this sheer desperation to be fairly competent at parenting, we almost convince ourselves that we're in control. And we're not. I can't prevent my daughter from having a skinned knee or a broken heart. I can't. So what I have to do is I have to just enjoy every day. Now, Leanne and I had the opportunity um, to um, realize the illusion of control early for us um, is when uh, our oldest was sick and uh, Jenea had a, had a disorder. And uh, when we finally were able to um, have a doctor diagnosis at Children's Hospital, um, she'd been sick for a long time. And the doctor said, uh, we don't know if she'll live past seven. And she was four at the time. And so instantly, I mean, that is just a, a punch to the gut. 
and um, in in you realize I can't control this. And um, now she God God used doctors and. Um, and man, the outlook has been awesome. And now she's graduated from college this year and um, lived beyond seven and, and has a very, very normal uh, life and lifespan ahead of her. Uh, but if I go back to when she was four and Leanne and I were sitting on a couch, not knowing the end of the story, mm -hmm. um, realizing we don't have control and we made a decision that day. We're like, okay, we can't control how long she lives. I pray that she'll live forever. Like not forever. That's like twilight <laughs> stuff, but, but like <laughs> 70 years, right? Um, is in, and, and we, would, we would pray, we'd say, God, we know you can. We ask that you would. And, and if I could push a button, I'll push a button, but we realize we can't. And so then here's what we realize. I mean, it's so empty and naked and vulnerable of like, I can't control what happens to my kid. And then you're like, Okay, I can control what I do and how I celebrate each day. And we made a decision when she was four. We don't know how long she's gonna live, but we do control how much life every day has. And we're gonna party. We're gonna, so we made the decision, we're gonna birthday party like no birthday parties ever. And it was a treadmill we had no idea that we were jumping on because on her fifth birthday party, it was the biggest full costume themed scavenger hunt. And I rented characters. It was crazy because we're like, we don't know. Is this the last one? And then as soon as you know that gets done, she goes, I can't wait till my sixth birthday. And we're like, <laughs> Oh, and, and now she's 22. So like, um, you know, we're like, we're going to go to Disney every year. Like we'll figure out a way. And, and now she lives at Disney World. Um, uh, so, but, but here's the deal. Some of these things that now we laugh at is we're just like, we, we didn't know. Um, we didn't know how long we have. We can control what we do with the time we have. So, and I, and I know it's easy for me to say that now because um, she's 22. Right, um, but when she was five, I had that same mentality, and it was a surrender of I can't control this. So, what is the one thing I can do? I can be present right now. So, um, if you're if you're going through a tragedy, you know, my recommendation is say, okay, the anxiety and fear is going to come when you try and control something you're not designed to control. So, what can you control right now? How do you handle it? The platform that you have right now of pain of suffering, um, caring for those that, that are there, or maybe you experience great loss. I don't have great words and I don't even know that you're ever going to get over it. I do think that you can get through it mm -hmm. and it's going to be through not avoiding grief. Um, uh, it's going to be through shouldering grief and, uh, weaving grief into your very DNA and, and being able to, there, there's a verse that <laughs> I've never seen tattooed. It's, I want to share in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings to know him completely. And I think that the, the people who have experienced great grief, um, if you allow it, grief can be this connection to Jesus that some of us who live in bubblegum rock, happy clappy Christian land um, will never take the time uh, or the journey to experience. So I think he could be close in the middle of tragedy and it doesn't make it good and it doesn't make it um, happy, um, but it makes it bearable. Um, That's something too, how... Uh, a question that I, I would have in my mind, um, how do we not get into a, a state of escapism as yeah. well um, to where as I, well, this place is going to a hell in a handbasket. This is just, this is how it is. Yeah. The world's broken. One day we're out of here. How, how do you go through that grief and how do you, I mean, exactly like that scripture that you just shared, share in the suffering, right. but understand that there's still life here. There's still life abundant. There's still like hope. Right. So it's just this like crazy like yeah. tug and pull of like how like the light this life is still beautiful right. right it's broken yeah but there's still beauty there's still right. like so I think that would be my last thought of just like how how do you touch on that how do you touch yeah. on on walking through that grief of sharing through that um, and staying in this healthy space um, and is a counselor helpful for grieving yeah 
Oh, uh, uh, hit that because that's a really easy answer. Absolutely, counselors yeah. are. I would say, is a physical doctor helpful for um, a broken arm? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, is a mental doctor helpful for a broken uh, synapsis? Um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, trauma isn't even the bad thing that happened in my past. Trauma is the bad thing I'm experiencing right now because of my past. And if I can have someone help me navigate that, um, absolutely. I, I would say this, bad theology... Um, uh, is what gets us to responding terribly. You know, there's a, um, if, if I believe, if I fundamentally believe that um, I'm gonna be protected from suffering because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, then my whole theological framework collapses when something bad happens to me. Mm-hmm. And we're not promised that. We're not promised that in scripture. Um, we're not promised that in church history. And so somewhere along the way, and, and that's why we got to be careful of, of we got to be careful of getting into that theology. We got to be careful of singing that theology mm. is I might not be happy. Um, and, and that's why I love any type of song that's angsty. That's like, God, what, what happens when life sucks? Like, I don't know how we make this a worship song, but man, life sucks and, and my disappointments are overwhelming me and I feel like you're a million miles away. It is well with my soul. Like that's good theology. You know, that's like the, the, the writer of the, the hymn, When Peace Like a River. Um, he had just lost his child and his wife and he pens these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. And I'm like, okay, good theology is not that we live in escapism and not that we live in immunity. Mm-hmm. Is our span of life isn't gonna be expanded because we're following Jesus. Now, because I'm following Jesus, I'm probably gonna do things that are a little bit more healthy in my life. So maybe, but it it doesn't mean that I don't live in a broken world. This is not heaven. And, um, and so when someone dies, the result of someone else's seems random behavior, drunk driving, um, or a sickness that is a monster to a cell, um, we don't understand it. That's when we just say, I, I, I can't control it. I don't understand it. I'm mad about it. I mourn in it. And I, and I, and I am banking that this isn't the end. Yeah. And I'm not gonna say that this is because God needed my child. I'm, not, I'm just gonna say this is a result of brokenness. Now, I can let that brokenness now um, eliminate any hope. Or I can say, okay, I need to cling on to this hope um, because this world is broken and how do I reflect God's hope in the midst of brokenness? So I think good theology is the, the, the framework of, hey, I'm gonna experience brokenness, pain, death. When I get to heaven, I don't know what that looks like, but here's what we see promised. There's none of that. So there is a hope. But that doesn't mean I'm not sad. That doesn't mean there's not a major loss and a major mourning. And I don't need to fast forward or skip my grief to be a good Christian. Mm -hmm. I can carry and wear that grief for a long time. That grief could be a gift for me to connect with Jesus. And I would encourage you, hey, um, when you see someone grieving like that, just join them, (laughs) join them in there. I said that was my last thing, but now this is my last thing. Okay. Here's another theory I have. Ready? Um, if you're listening, I think that you can probably think, man, that's tough for them. Or, yeah, if I ever get into that situation, I think that COVID-19 put us all into a state of grief. Because mm-hmm. I think no matter where you're coming from, something has been lost. Yeah, The loss of absolutely. normalcy, the loss of life, the loss of relationship, the loss of connection. There's a lot of people I don't talk to that I did. I haven't grieved those moments. So I think all of us are walking through that together you see that within jobs. I mean, this is the most I've ever seen anybody walk away from jobs and unemployment and can't find, like there's just so much change. So this is my last thing. Yeah. Even though it's not going to be this very um, definitive grief moment that someone would see as like a loss of a life. We have seen through COVID the loss of something. Yeah. Right. So just touch on that a little bit of what you've seen in that how do we walk through that as a community? Because um, it's not as easy as like, let's show, we're all kind of in it together. And it's, right. 
I think probably different than I've seen in my lifetime or most people have that we're all grieving at the same moment. Right. Um, so in our last couple of minutes, just, just touch on that. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts? Um, I, I think anytime we grieve, whether it's at a funeral or we're grieving the loss of something in our life through COVID, um, whether it's a job, a normal, a friendship, a relationship, I think grief is the opportunity and the invitation to honor something that meant a lot to you, right? So a funeral isn't a time to just deny. It's not the great denial. Don't, why are you crying? They wouldn't want, they wouldn't want you crying. I always tell the end, <laughs> if my funeral's before yours, tell people, cry away. <laughs> I want them to be like, what a great loss we experienced. <laughs> now at the end, I'll say, I want someone to say, well, I, I probably want to say, well, I want someone to be able to say, okay, now I know that you guys are all broken up and you're barely going to be able to function for years. However, there will be some hope, but give yourself plenty of time to mourn because it's a great loss. And then I joke about that, but I, but I mean that is anytime we have a funeral of someone, we're honoring our loss and how important they were to us. And if I can't be robbed of that, my mind and emotions can't just ignore it and skip. I will begin um, uh, to, to have dysfunction. And what's even crazier is during COVID, like uh, Jamie's uh, grandmother passed away and they had a limited funeral. Ah, uh, yeah. Right? Like that's, so I mean, it's heavy when you just think about it. Right. Like grief isn't there right now. Yeah. Which is crazy. Keep so, so and then with COVID is, you know, um, your job might've changed. It's healthy. Instead of just push on, we're going to work twice as hard. We're going to get back to the results. And that's fine. You might land there one day, but today just, if you haven't yet, just be like, Ah, like, like as a pastor, I grieved the loss of a thousand people that celebrated with us. Now, will we'll people come back and well, yeah, but, but that's great. But let me take a moment and grieve the fact that and I, I've lost a connection with a lot of people. Um, I lost a, a relationship in here, whatever it is you lost, take a moment, name it, grieve it. Don't, don't allow yourself to celebrate yet. Just give yourself some time to just sit with it. It's a gift. It allows you to honor what you had, acknowledge what you've lost. You'll have plenty of time in seminars to help you regroup and recharge the hill later. And church is good at that. <laughs> and, and, and Christian culture is good at that. Well, we, we want to encourage, and I think that's a, a helpful tool, but you don't need to be encouraged when you grieve. You need to be uh, comforted when you grieve. And isn't that one of the things is blessed are those who mourn. Mm -hmm is a beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Cursed are those who fake it because you will have to relive it. So blessed are those who mourn. So maybe you're here in, in your mourning. Man, I hope you sense God's comfort and blessing and I hope you have people, uh, Jesus with skin on in your life who can help sit with you in that middle of mourning and there's plenty of time to celebrate later. And we'll get there. But today, mourn it, mourn a loss. That's so good. That's so helpful. And hopefully the, the person that sent this in, hopefully you're listening. Hopefully this is helpful. Yeah. Hopefully this is helpful to, to others. And uh, we're all in it together. We're all in the same game. Yeah. So I appreciate your thoughts on it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Hey, thanks for listening. And I think uh, we beat even our record of take 29. Yeah, this so. is take 27. Sweet. This is fast. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Quick. All right. Thanks for joining us in the Riff. <laughs> thanks for listening to this episode of The Riff. Submit a question for the podcast at northpointchurch.tv slash podcast. We'll have a brand new episode every week wherever you find podcasts.